from Liverpool. He's a, a performance poet, he's a musician, he's also one of the so called brown babies, the name given to the people born with black eyes and uh, white British women in the Second World War and in the, in the 50s. So he it was born in the 50s and he's going to tell us, read us one of his, because he's also a writer, he's going to read us one of your stories. Isn't that well, right? I'll explain it. Okay, so Eugene, <laughs> thank you. Okay. I'd just like to say it's an honour and privilege to be here. One, because Rick still is like the black capital of the UK. Yeah. <laughs> of the world. Of the world. What this is is just a load of notes I scribbled out, like a bit of a stream of consciousness. Um, because I've, I've wrote extensively on, on, on this subject, and all my stuff is just online uh, on a site called booksy.com under ES line, so there's depth on there. I'll just do this. I entitle this Always the Other because if I'm in a black community, sometimes I am the other. If I'm in a white community, sometimes I am the other. If I'm in North Africa, you know, people think I'm Moroccan. That's one of the first places I felt at home, actually, because everybody there was mixed. And everybody was saying, you're from here? I was saying, no, actually, I'm from England. They're going, no, no, somewhere down the line, you used to come from here. And it was just beautiful um, to be accepted instead of denied. So I'll start the story. My story begins when Master Sergeant Eugene, Eugene, uh, Eugene, Eugene Golden, United States Air Force, was stationed at Sealand Air Base on the Wirral from 1952 to 1958. From there he met my mother, Florence Annie Lang from Everton in Liverpool. I was born in 1955. The last thing I remember about my pop was a birthday card I received for my third birthday from Japan, which I still have. I had one photo room taken in Anchorage, Alaska, but his face was hidden by a shadow and all you could see was just black basically. I knew he was half African American, half Native American, Mohawk Indian, and that he was from Texas. I knew I had his face and even aspects of his personality because my mum and other people who knew him told me so. I knew about the Southern States and the Ku Klux Klan vaguely. Wrestling on TV was big viewing amongst the mothers of that time. I identified with Masambula and Johnny Quango, the two African wrestlers and Billy Two Rivers, who was a Native American wrestler. When we played Johnny Quest, I was Hadji. When we played Robinson Crusoe, I was Manfredi. We played the Lone Ranger, I was Tonto. <laughs> By the age of five, <clears throat> my Cuban-American stepdad and father to my sister, Tracy Belinda, his name was Arturo Bellardo, he came on the scene. Arturo was a Cuban who had left Cuba for New York and worked as a merchant seaman for the United States lines. He sailed on the American courier and the American scientist. Toro, it was who I called dad at the time, he brought me all the coolest kids stuff from the States. I had a, a massive chemistry set, art materials, real cowboy shirts, jeans, boots from Texas. Needless to say, one of my favorite things was an eagle feathered headdress, a buckskin suit with fringes, beaded moccasins, Tomahawk, a sheath knife, and a bow and arrow, oh, and some medicine beads and a tom tom. He also bought me a book on the various tribes and customs, which I studied religiously like it was a Bible. A Toro played Spanish guitar. He would jam with the Caribbean Calypsonian guys on Granby Street outside Pee Wee the Barbers, which is, as anybody knows in any black community, Barbers is where a lot of people hang out. People like Lord Woodbine, who was the Beatles' first manager. He saw me my first drum kit, which he said used to belong to Ringo. <laughs> I, also, I also picked up my love for the bongos and Afro-Cuban music from the Toro. Two years after the Toro showed up, my sister Tracy was born. She was a bit lighter than me, fair hair, green eyes, but she had easily recognisable Hispanic features, what they call a high yellow in the States. My mother was part German, Dutch, Scottish and English. She had three brothers and three sisters, 
My auntie Ethel May married a Malayan seaman, my uncle Osman. He was half Malayan and half Afghani, born in Singapore. Beatrice Alice married a Somali seaman, my uncle Hussein. And my auntie Maggie, the oldest of sisters, married my uncle Omre Roberts, who was a devout Welshman and a big fan of Di Francis of the Black and White Minstrel Show. <laughs> so we'd all watch that every Sunday. And my mother's younger brother, Uncle Billy, he was a merchant seaman. He jumped ship in Kuwait for two years, came back a Muslim, flew into Arabic, and called himself Muhammad Khalil. A name he'd taken from a Sudanese student friend of the family back in Liverpool. My Uncle Billy also spoke German, Dutch, Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, and was very much into researching Northern European Viking roots, and he was also a beatnik. Now, although the black community was only a 15-minute walk from where I was born in Everton, I knew it quite well and had family there, but it was a world away from the white working-class area of Everton. In Everton, we grew up divided between Catholics and Protestants. Nevertheless, on the streets, I was given the name Gene the Nigger by certain gangs. There was one other mixed-race kid, my mate Benny. He lived a bit closer to the black community, but to get to his house, I had to run the gauntlet of these gangs I'd have to sneak through their tear with my head down. I'd be waiting to hear the cry, this nigga, let's get him, <clears throat> and I'd be ready to run. Benny and his sister, Manny, were half Nigerian. They had an older sister, Sadie, whose dad was Arab, a younger brother, Abel, who was alabaster white with red hair and blue eyes. But this was normal in Liverpool late, and still is today. Families can have siblings with separate mothers or even separate fathers. And also there are a lot of foster families, like the one my mother eventually ran as she got older. We grew up from our teens onwards with Irish, Nigerian, Jamaican, Malayan, Arab, and of course English foster siblings. No one distinguished between half-step foster or adopted siblings. Brothers and sisters were brothers and sisters. I knew many families where this is the case. Once you were family, you were family. I put this down to the old matriarchy system of inclusion which is similar to the Native American system of making blood brothers, but also due to the fact that women had been the decision makers, as many of the men were often at sea, and they were at sea for long trips. So your mother's friends were your aunties, her kids were your cousins. <coughs> I'm 11 years old, I passed the 11 plus, I won a scholarship to Liverpool Collegiate Grammar School for Boys. This is one of the best schools in Liverpool, very prestigious. We did Latin. I loved Latin. We sang the school song in Latin. Viva Tyke Sol Dolatas, Decca says Merdunite. Viva Tyke Sol Dolatas, Decca says Merdunite. Nullius Quam Fossa Bender, Semper in Kailum Talende, Madum Wiro. Then one day. <laughs> Then one day, in Latin class, we're memorising by throat the words for colours. The word for black in Latin is nigger. So the whole class is chanting, nigger, nigger, niggerum, nigger armus, nigger arses, nigger ant. We do this for a while, just drilling the words. It, it's case endings, declensional case endings, over and over, until it's ingrained on our cerebral cortex. Next, the Latin master goes through the class, picking out individuals to recite on their own, just to test who's memorised it. If they stumble, we drill it as a class again, then we go back to testing it as individuals. Of course, everybody is sniggering all the way through the lesson, as I'm the only black kid in the class. I'm one of three non-white kids in amongst roughly a thousand pupils in the whole school. When it came to my turn to recite, I had no problem memorising the order amidst the muffled chuckling and secret giggles and laughing of my peers. I can't remember how I felt actually, but I remember the smug, sardonic, sinister, sadistic grin on the Latin master's face. He thought he was cool, I just thought he was a square. You know, Billy told me that, he was a beatnik. <laughs> I recited, I'm all a mass, I'm at, I'm almost, I'm artist, I'm man's, but to myself. What that means is, I love, he loves, she loves, we love, we, you know. Personal pronouns with the verb to love. The snobs referred to me as the native. They never addressed me directly, but to whoever was with me at the time, they'd say, 
tell your native friend this, or tell the natives that. And I'd be just standing in front of them, next to the person, but you just ignore me. Nevertheless, I was not totally isolated at the collegiate. In the second year, I made friends with David Norman. David lived in Cadogan Street, which is in the heart of the black community, and he was white. His mother had then married a guy from Antigua. So David had a brother, him and his brother Peter were white, and his younger brother and his younger sister were both mixed race. His best mate's house to school was a mixed race guy called Andy. They both boxed, and they were in the army cadets. Andy went to Paddington Comp, the local black school, halfway between Liverpool 7 and Liverpool 8. I lived in Liverpool 6. All the kids were big afros. Motown and the Afrocentricity of the late 60s and early 70s was just starting to amaze. So one day, David and I are standing up against the wall in the playground reading comics. We're only second years, and the cock of the third year approaches us with his sidekicks and his henchmen. And he says to David, tell the native we don't like him. <coughs> David ignored him. Then he snatched the comic out of David's hand and scrunched it up. Now it was cold, and David was wearing these big fairy mittens. He just shook them off his hands, and he lived a, a flurry of jabs to the face of the racist bully. And he boxed the ears of a few of his mates as well. Now, his henchmen came at me, but I'd been practicing jiu-jitsu since I was seven. And I, you know, I, I, was, I wasn't a, an aggressive person, but I, I could stand up for myself. So I started throwing people all over the place. Mm -hmm. The only moves I did was, was a few throws and kneeing them in the solar plexus, because that would just win you. <coughs> now this is the 60s, no one had seen Bruce Lee or Kung Fu, but they'd seen lots of character movies. And the nearest that they could make out, because they knew I had Native American in me, was that I was doing Indian fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, they just called us the Lone Ranger and Tonto, and stayed out of our way. I also had some cool friends who were soul boys, these were white guys into Tamil Motown, scooters, the whole mod thing. David Songard, whose father was a Norwegian seaman, and whose brother and sister also went away to sea, had a vast collection of Motown LPs, all imports on the original Detroit Raven with the Red Star. His crew were actually honoured to have a GI kid hang with them. By my teens, I was, I was beginning to turn black and identify myself as black. Richard Pryor had made the N-word a harmless joke. The last poets had made it a weapon. Malcolm X and the Black Panthers and Angela Davis had made it a badge of honour. One drop of black blood and he's a nigger. That's how it worked on slavery, and it does even today. If you were a mulatto, or if you were a quarter catcher or a quadroon, if you were an eight catcher or an octroon, right the way down to Sang Mele, which was the 64th cast. If you was the sang Mary, you couldn't marry a white man's daughter, you couldn't own property, and you could still be bought and sold as a slave. So as far as I was concerned, you know, I had more than one drop of black blood in me. And anybody in the white community that seen me had no, I was black. There was no doubt, there was none of this mixed race thing. You was, you was a nigger, you're black. End of story. So I embraced the African American heritage and my Mohawk heritage to the max. During the next 30 years, I would become a community arts activist. During which time, I would visit many black art centres up and down the UK and imbibe all things countercultural and post colonial, from Che Guevara to Leopold Senghor, Amokar Cabral, Amiri Baraka, Umbugi Wathiongo, Marcus Garvey, the many pranksters, Ram Das, Guru Maharaji, Gurdjieff Rumi, Idris Shah. Carl Jung, right up to present day Ken Wilber. I became a sort of dread dervish, spiritually eclectic, but firmly rooted in the Socialist Workers' Party and all things left. A Jamaican guy called Tommy Lloyd, who was a black version of Wolfie Smith from Citizen Smith. <laughs> he ran the SWP black section called Black Flame, self-defense. Black self-defense is no offense, that was the motto. He used to wear a black berry and an army jacket, just covered in badges. I did a part-time diploma in youth and community work in Chilwell. One year later, I was working with a group called Community Industry under a guy called Dave Edward, Dave Elwant, who was part Iranian. And I was part of the LA Youth Workers Consortium. The course was run by Bert Jones. I did a car, I did I did a, I did my training at Cartrefy College in Rex in North Wales. North Wales. Um, college. 
And I lived here with Bed Jones. He was a real socialist from South Wales in the valleys. He got us into Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Saul Alinsky. That was derived from the Theatre of the Oppressed by Augustus Boal. I was deeply into counselling, Christa Mertie, Carl Young, R.D. Lang, and our counselling teacher who had a severely disabled son. Um, she was the one that got me into the kind of spiritual stuff. And she was very much influenced by Christa Mertie. I did a lot of sociology, psychology, group psychology, leadership training, and my last three month placement, <coughs> yet to be practical placements, I was put in Tiger Bay in Butetown, also known as the Docks, which is Cardiff's black community. Cardiff is the only place where the community is as mixed as Liverpool is in the UK. Uh, you've got West African, you've got Caribbean, you've got Black GI, Somalis, Yemenis, and Malayans, randomly mixed with the indigenous wealth producing all kinds of hybrid, unclassifiable breeds and an influx of Windrush people and Asians on top of that because the first group mostly made some semen. I was placed in the Butan Youth Centre for three months. I was staying with my boss and supervisor and his family in his house in his son's room who the son was away at sea. My boss was an elderly Jamaican guy, one of the Windrush generation and a local hero with an OBE for 30 years service to the black community. I was like a bit of a raster soupy with dreadlocks and um, so you know we're different generations <clears throat> so he drops me off at the house of this young dread about my age this is after work now the brother when he dropped me off he had a sound system uh, he could get me some herbs and uh, he introduced me to a group of rasters called the United Island of Israel who had got hold of the issue swirl bath and turned it into an art centre they also had a reggae band and used to rehearse in the centre, but they never had a drummer. I was a boss reggae drummer. Within a week, I'd settled into Cardiff's black community and was meeting all the artists, all the activists and creatives right across the city. I saw an African drum and dance band echo me from Bristol to a residency at the centre. During the three-week Easter holiday, one thing led to another, and after I returned to Liverpool, I ended up setting a group like echo me called the Lardo School of Africa with help from local arts activist Ebony Carroll. Now, Ebony, who had been living and working in London with Peter Blackman as part of Steel and Skin, she was in town visiting her mother, who lived across the grove from my mother. It was Steel and Skin who had set up Ecomy in Bristol, and eventually, with the help of a lot of other people, we set up the Lardo in Liverpool. After the Lardo, I set up Odudawa, a black performing arts cooperative that specialised in Pan-African fusion arts. Then I ended up forming a group called Imagine Yourselves, which had Jamaican, Sri Lankan, Chilean, and a white guy with red hair and blue eyes, and me. And we all shared poetry, and we had like saxophones, congas, bits of music. But again, it was a bit like a beatnik thing. Each of us was a different shade of colour. Um, and that was making statements. For me, black essentialism had run its course. I was starting to move out of that thing. Um, and because we were all a different colour, that was that, that represented a quite a stunning image at the time, because people weren't mixing that much. Now, let's cut this show for a bit. For example, 30 years after the Lado. So not only was I getting stick off white supremacists, but 30 years after the Lado. The idea came up in the community, let's do a tribute to the Lardo. So, <clears throat> a girl born from Jamaican parents, but actually brought up in um, Wolverhampton, decided they're going to reform it, but the only one, the full black people, and the only one people of Jamaican origin, no Trinis, no Bajans, you know, no red people, no, no Grannies, no Vinces. So I was like that. I started it. I'm not even Caribbean, you know, and I'm light-skinned. So I confronted them with it. And they were all, they were, the thing is, none of them were from Liverpool. One was from London, one was from Bradford, one was from, like, Wolverhampton. They were from different places. And I said, you know, don't come down to the city bringing that kind of racism. Because we're waiting for me. Often these people got jobs after they left the project. I said, you wouldn't even be working now. So they denied it and all this. But that pissed me off. So after that, I knew an Nigerian guy, very middle class, he used to look down on me. And, and he didn't realise who he was until he went to the States. And he'd come back 
And then he realized, you know, you might be blocking me on the outside, but inside, you're like a white man. You, you come in here trying to aspire to join the middle class white society, just like a conservative. And I took him on. And he might have to come back to the States, he apologized to me. He was like that. I totally understand you now being to America, which pleased me no end. Then, you know, I was part of the Black Arts Alliance. And they said, oh, somebody's putting together an anthology of black literature. We want you to um, contribute. So I, I sent them something. The woman got back to me and said, um, this doesn't sound very black to me. Um, why don't you find somebody who wants to publish mixed race literature? Pissed me off, no end. So after that, uh, I used to say, you know, I met Bob Marley. I've seen him perform twice. And I used to say to people, you know what, the, I'm a reggae drummer. You know what the one drop means? Yeah, it's a one drop reggae rhythm. But Bob Marley, in Revolution, he says, in eyes is white, in eyes is black, in eyes is red, in Eddie Egg. Marley worked in the States, in Detroit, in the car factories. He knew about the one drop rule. He knew. You know, because they used to call him the German in Jamaica. And he got a lot of stick growing up. He couldn't use mixed race. Mm. But I used to say, you know, this person who is race, he's mixed race. I've met him and I, he related to me because I'm red. And I used, to, I used to wind people up. So I got into this position of, I'd annoy white people because I'd just be totally open about race. And it, and it was all, let's not talk about race. It's like, you know, there's no racism now, yet it is. I'd annoy black people because I'd tell them about their racism. And I'd challenge them. And you know, I've got a PhD, I just don't go around telling everybody. <laughs> And then... <laughs> you told us. We all know now. <laughs> but you know, and so then, I just continued, I was going around as a community artist. Like a self-styled jazz griot, that's what I used to call myself. I'd be writing, teaching, travelling, and I performed, I did that for about 30 years. During which time, as I said, I trained in client-centered therapy. I trained as an ESOL teacher, I did the Carl Rogers method of therapy, I did the BA honours, an MA, and then eventually PhD in literary theory and cultural history. Which is very hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, so by now, I've been to New York, I've traced me dad. Well, I traced our Tracy's brother because of Toro died. And I traced their brother, she had some Cuban family in New York. I traced them, and um, that was great because my nephews, they eventually went over and, and met um, Pancho and um, Alejandro and Maria, and, and they, they were all detectives. So I was made up, I thought, now look, our family, not criminals, go and meet your family over in the States and get some good role models. Because everybody knows the danger of growing up in the ghetto, there's a good chance you're going to end up in jail, dead or selling drugs or something. So, you know, I needed some good role models. So I was made up that I, I'd hook them up. And they both lived in Spain. They'd worked in Spain for years. They were both fluent in Spanish. All Malik's girlfriend did uh, a degree at the University of Valencia. So you know she's got up Spanish. And they all got on really well. So I'd sorted my sister and my nephews out. Now it was time to find out who my own dad was. But I knew him. I'd seen him for 40 years. The Jazz had been in and around Liverpool from the 40s up until the 80s. He hung out with us. He went to the same black clubs as us. Many families in Liverpool had American links, either from people who had married or moved over there, or Americans who had settled locally. There were many black GI kids, legitimate and illegitimate, who I eventually knew as I was growing up. One day, a local brown baby who had traced her biological father gave me a dress and buried them of an organisation called War Babies, ran by a woman called Shirley. I sent them details from letters I had from Pop to Mum, that Mum had left when she died. And I'd never read them. I just got the address. I just, for some reason, I just didn't read them. I got a response two years later from Shirley. And um, she'd found them. She found two names that matched up. But I, I just knew straight away who it was. Um, it'd been stationed all over the world in 26 different places during those 30 years in the service. Um, I wrote to him, I got a response. My eldest sister, Wanda Jean, got in touch with me. I had phone numbers. I spoke to them on the phone. I found out I had four sisters in Austin, Texas, and a whole bunch of extended family. 
Pretty soon after that, I arranged a two-week trip to Austin. It was a dream come true, a truly magical episode on many levels. I won't go into it now, but it's written in detail on Gucci.com under ES9. I heard some of my dad's songs, and one was about a woman called Maria, who he'd left with a daughter. Now I thought, he hasn't just made that up. I discussed the ideas with my sisters that we may have a sister in Spain, according to my deductions. They agreed, they knew, but they had no idea how to trace it. Come on. <laughs> I got to all that already now. How many I have? So, when I was 17, living in Fazaki with my mother, I'd been engaged to a girl called Laura, whose parents didn't want me around. Her dad was nice on front. One day, her dad had an elder brother, you know what I mean? One day, her dad had an elder brother, came to my mother's house in Fazakli and warned me to stay away from him. So I never want to mince words. I said, why? Because I'm an idiot. You know, like that. Ready to get out the door and start fighting with them. And he goes in, you're not even a nigger, lad. You're only a half chat. My mother came out and threatened him with my granddad's fireman's She said, call my son a half chat and I'll cleave your head from your shoulders. And with that, he fled. Needless to say, he sent me all away. I never saw her again until one day I get a phone call from Dave Ward. He was a director of an organisation called Windows. And I used to get a lot of work in schools and I used to get poetry kicked off these people. He said, a woman called Lorna has traced you to Windows and is asking for your number. Shall I give you your number? I knew straight away who it was. I said, yeah, give me the number. And uh, when she called me, I was not surprised to hear that she'd been pregnant and he'd taken the baby from her and got the baby adopted. Oh. And she'd not even been able to see it or know anything about it. Now, that was the same story as many of the brown babies the generation before. Our daughter had traced her mother three years previously uh, and then she just... She, Laura hadn't told her about me. She traced me on the internet and then got onto her mother and said, Look, I want to meet her, I want to meet her. So Laura says, eh, She wants to meet you, Jean. I said, By all means. She, and she, you know, Laura's like that. She is yours, Jean, she is yours. Mm -hmm. I, said, I said, I don't doubt it for any minute. So, um, ironically, Laura's brother now. He's married to a Jamaican woman and has been for 20 years. So people can change. That's the truth. People can change. You know, and he's a different person. But again, the story of the brown babies continues as a struggle against racism. And when I bought a copy of the book Britain's Bound Babies for my daughter and one for my grandson who's 23, she recognised this story. She said, that's my story. I said, it's the story of all the people in the book Britain's Brown Babies. They were also adopted. She said, that's my story. I said, you know what, babe? It's all our stories. She looked at me and it hit me. She was not just a random chocolate drop bought up in Tewksbury. There were many random chocolate drops dotted all around the country. And together we were all unique. We all had our own stories, but it was the same story, really. The story about racism and robbers and family ties, people, memories, experiences, and what the book did for me, it gave me something to hand down to my daughter that she had, you know, it was uniquely relevant to her life history mm -hmm. and it was to mine. And she could now have some pertinent stories to pass on to our grandsons, or well, my grandsons, her sons, you know, in shower. You know, and you can, you can pass this on and it comes to the book, it's not going to go away. And also, you know, they can pass it on to their kids. And the thing is, they don't feel excluded, they're part of it. If the book does that, that's the magic of the written word. You know, being a professor of literary here, I've got to say that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and another thing is, you know, it, it, it made such a sense out of at one time was a messy identity. All of a sudden, we were part of the group. You know, we were just part of the group, and that made us stronger. Not in the outside world, inside. So ethnically, even my grandsons identify as black and they're proud of being a mixed race. But only last month, Irene, my Spanish sister, traced me. Remember the song? 
Mm-hmm. And then what is his name's Maria? And the song we got wrote, it goes in. I'm coming back to you, Maria. I'm coming back to you real soon. Please tell the baby. It's cool to Western. Texas <laughs> Please tell the baby that I love her. And she'll be with us on our honeymoon. No. I said, that's, that's wrong with it. I said, that's wrong with it. That's really singing about. She cried. Hopefully she's going to come. She's going to come over. He said with the fourth to spend some time and introduce her to the people in Liverpool. And she's already hooked up now with my daughter. She's hooked up with Wanda, Grace, Pamela and Sheila, who are the four sisters in the States. And also their daughters, and, and they've got kids. So got, like, all of a sudden, from being this one black kid in Spain, she's got a network. And she can explore that now. And it's important to know your roots. It just is. And so, what I was going to say, yeah, you know, she cried. And, and what I thought, I need to brush up on my Spanish, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but to me, you know, being part of Native America, they have the concept of the sacred hoof. And uh, when, when, he, when he invaded America, he destroyed a lot of the sacred hoofs. When he invaded Africa, he destroyed the other sacred human. What I think my work as an artist is, is to repair the pieces in that sacred human. And part of that is just my own personal pieces that together. But then that little hoop overlaps into the little loop set of here. And I always finish with this thing. You know, my identity is I am. Don't put anything at the end of it, because that's reductive. I just am. My religion is love, and my struggle is against ignorance. And the word I like, Ubuntu, it means I am because we are. It also means it's not good for anybody, it's not good. <laughs> okay, thank you. The, the real take home things already today about the ordinary, and whilst your story is very complex, to hear it in an ordinary setting, from an ordinary voice, from an ordinary person, um, really underlines the fact that no matter how complex our connections are and our personal family histories are, we are ordinary people. Uh, the theme today about being mixed, what it means to be mixed, finding a sense of identity and community. Um, these stories, your story, my story, all of our stories are important. And that's why they, these kind of kind of uh, spaces are really important because we can share those stories, listen to them, and 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 reflect on them, mm. normalising them. You know, I think often people from mixed families hold back on their personal histories for for reasons like you brought up about sort of black essentialism, mm. picking sides. Um, and so, yeah, it is really important to get our own personal stories out there. I'm sure there's uh, a few books in all of us. Has all your story been archived? I hope so. No. Why not? Uh, Luke was a redneck town, it's like Alabama. <laughs> it's like Alabama. You know, I'm public enemy number one over there. Up there, do you think I'm not the next? And plus, I'm a Muslim. That was great up until 9 11. And then I had my house bugged, I got arrested, I got kidnapped by the security forces and tortured for five weeks. I've had a shit time at the hands of those honkies up there. So you've written your own story then yourself? I've got it on Booksy, I've got some of it on Booksy. Yeah. But you know what, I, I haven't bothered writing for a long time because nobody's interested. I got rejected from a lot of black publishers for being mixed race. I just saw, put it to one side. It is emerging because I'm mm. better, we've got a, we're challenging the museum now and saying that we've got a place. And they're saying, ooh, because it, it ticks in with one of their funding ticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could literally say, look, this is a, a lost history, can we archive this? Mm. The other thing they love is that we'll show you this. Oh, have you got any pictures? Have you got any, I've any got artifacts? Any, anything like that, they love it. Well, what, one of the things I did, um, you know, because I do music and, and stuff and poetry and stuff, I did little videos, but I, I had like photos of like when we were all dreads 
when we had the big afros. And you saw the different cultural stages that were going on locally, you know. And, and also in those pictures, it wasn't just all black people. You know, we had Malays, we had Chinese, Arabs, mixed with all other stuff, you know, Asians, and you know, white people and everything. And it's like, what, what I consider the little a community to be, it's like a Creole community. You know, it's a bit like the Cajuns. Yeah. You can be any colour, but you're still a foreigner. You, yeah. you know, you're part of this, this, this scum class that's held down by the elites, you know what I mean? Well, I went to find you and your story, because I was looking at my, my research has been based on mixed race people want to find their story. Mm -hmm. And I found a book on the living of the years and how, where your story comes up. And I was fascinated. I didn't know anything about that. And it was amazing about World War II, evacuate, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And it's amazing that someone's written, they have written a book, but these, unless we tell our story and we get it into some sort of format, no one's going to be able to read it. And then, you know, it will be gone. Well, the thing is in Liverpool, you know, it's run by the council, and the council just wants stereotypes. They want stereotypes. They're backwards. Liverpool's a retarded place. Can you put it on chat for mixed? Say it again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I'll take that right down yeah. the website. Yeah, yeah. Please, yeah. yeah. I mean, I could, you mean that text? You mean put the text on our photos? We can archive it. We can put okay. whatever needs to be archived. Yeah. That means the whole generation. Yeah. Uh, in Redford, we're trying to we're trying to document the Windrush group because they're all dying. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Right. And that's but the other thing is, you see, sure. what's different between my perspective and the younger people here is I grew up with black power. Yeah, I grew up with Martin yeah. X, Martin yeah. Luther King, Angela Davis, yeah, the Black yeah. Panthers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we started the riots, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and after the 80s, yeah. you made sure they wouldn't do that. Yeah. The space wouldn't again. have been, been so built used, So yeah. what black people did, uh, uh, instead of going for their own hmm. culture, they just, they just opted for black capitalism. And they brought in the hip-hop, people killing each other. It was a divine rule again. People went from a pan-African unity where Latin America and Everybody was involved to gangs, mm. neighborhoods fighting each other. Mm. And, and that, that was orchestrated. There's no, there's no way that wasn't orchestrated by the slave master. Mm. You know, this is the way it is. We can't say that. Mm. So you want to do something? Yeah. <laughs> you, when you said no one wants your story, everyone would. And I think that Len C says, my name is Wyatt, has now set a new precedent. Yeah. And I think you must go to Cannon Gate, if you feel you can do it, because you're a poet, you're a musician, you're a Cannon Gate, the publisher, who published Len's My Name is Why. And I, I urge you to do this because the richness is needed and there is a sense of baton passing, all those things that you yeah, so beautifully yeah. articulate. And mm -hmm. please, if you have the energy, then well, the story yeah. is wanted and it is mm. needed and it can be published. Mm. I feel it very strongly. Yeah. Oh, I've said about oh, long yeah. versions of little, mm -hmm. little bits and bobs on Booksy. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And uh, because, you know, I, I lost the interest basically about 10 years ago. Yeah. But when, when, you know, when I'm putting a tour to me, basically, you know, I was like. Yeah. But I've been to Saudi, I've been back and forth to North Africa, Turkey, Yemen. And you know, this is what I was telling us. Because I'm aggressive as well, I want to get on that subject. You know, mm -hmm. it's, I frighten them. But our, Jamie Bean would definitely, he would love that, what you just said, your work. Because of this priest. Who's that? Well, the um, Canon Gate publisher who published Lens, My Name is Why, yeah. there is now, it's a proven. Um, readership right across every kind of category for a human story that is intrinsic to modern Britain yeah. as yours is and, and so you know No one lost this was no because as I said you know I just yeah. basically just shut me down. You know they shut me down and yeah. I'm, I'm basically being under house arrest. I'm surprised you haven't followed me down here to see what I'm doing. <laughs> well you never know <laughs> <laughs> out for me is that I'm sure if lots of people feel like you do when you've kind of faced your, your own personal struggle, you've come up against elements of the system and it does it does you know you know push you down and, 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 and make you feel like nobody wants to hear. And so but the only time I ever get any interest is when I leave Liverpool. Yeah. 
Okay. It's a retarded place. Lots of messiahs have found that, I think. That they leave the place where they are because they're not appreciated there and they, they're appreciated elsewhere. I think one of the things that struck me about my takeaway is that um, we've all got stories, but not many people can tell them the way you do. You've got an artist in you, you're a poet, you've, you're an entertainer, and um, that, that, is, that can be limiting. So, in a sense, you get the whole thing. With you, which is what oh, is part which, of. See, I don't know this because I don't meet anybody else. Well, there you go. You've got a lot of fans in this room. No, people like that. You laugh. I'm thinking, shut up. We've not just got the stories, but we can tell them really good. And he that's not the monitor. Yeah. Uh, he, he Aaron, I forgot to bring the blues half yeah, down. I do blues. He gave this great talk at a book launch. And um, he took out his harmonica at the end, and everyone was in tears. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I rest my case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to leave. I'm leaving at you know, five o'clock this morning. So I'm like, but we have to get the same train. It must be so expensive. We come later. Sorry, can you not use your academic way in? Because you've got a doctor, truly, you know, Not really. Listen, somebody told me a long time ago, what do you call Batman with a PhD? Dr. Nigger. Because that's all he's ever going to be in a white supremacist society. And that, that was Malcolm X, yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, you know, and that's been true for me. Uh, if you've got an intelligence and you're black and you won't compromise, the I would kill you. Or, or drive you mad or put you in jail. There's no, there's no I, other I way think, around it. I think there's a point where you just come with, even if people do think of you or feel of you about you in that way, you know who you are. Yeah, I, I mean, we all have to get to the point where, you know, we, we know what the what, what kind of assumptions people make about us, how they attack us, you know. I'm not how, talking about assumptions, I'm talking about... How ideology you know. wears us all down. But... but we, you know, you talked about you talked about client-centered therapy, or yeah, yeah. well, the self-realization. You know, the self-actualization right. is what we're all striving for. And I think what people collectively in this room are saying to you: you had us riveted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no one spoke; everyone listened. Which, you know, is a reflection of what you're giving out. You're giving out a piece of yourself. So perhaps, you know, that's a takeaway for you. Well, I really appreciate the comments. It's made me feel. Give me some hope that I might get published before I die. Yeah. You need to make that happen. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about. A few jokes. Sorry. A few jokes. No, I'm more interested in Liverpool's evolution as a place and and a place that's associated with a long history of mixing. And how that place has shaped you is very clear. Yeah, yeah. But just if you could just say a little bit about how you feel Liverpool's continual racial evolution I think it's changed uh, affects, time. affects your, your own life experience now, looking back. How, how do you think Liverpool today, uh, how, how do you understand it from that early experience you've had? Well, let me show you what it was like when I was growing up. It was still a seaport, so there was lots of people coming and going. A lot of the white people there were used to going to Brazil, West Africa, the Caribbean. They were used to mixing with people. Like my Uncle Billy, you know, as mates with Sudanese and Yemeni, he, 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 they were used to mixing. Once the, once the seaport stopped, Everybody was just stuck there. And the, the new generation is just hillbillies, the redneck shit kickers. And, and if you talk with a different accent, you come from Wigan, you call the Wigan back. They're really insular. Now you've, now it, it's, and all these places have, paradoxically, you know, southern comfort, southern hospitality. There's warm people there, there's great people there. But the undercurrent is, is like, keep, keep black people down. One of my friends, Crafty Champion, they come round, oh, you, you know, you're, you're the little space person to, to win this karate thing. And we're going to write him up, he goes to the new, newspaper, the Echo, he didn't write him up about it. A white guy wins it the next year, he put him up there, he's the first little person. 
they, didn't, they don't want black people to achieve anything in Liverpool. And, and unless you're from there, unless you've been somebody like me that's penetrated that, you know, I used to have dinner with the Lord Mayor. You know, I've got through to different levels. I used to be judge on different sorts of arts award ceremonies and stuff like this. And unless you've been in, in, that intimate with the city, you won't have any idea what it's like. You know, you, you need to live in Alabama. That will give you an idea of what it's like in Liverpool. The heart, it's a slave place. I was the person, the first person to write a poem on slavery. Can you believe that? And I kicked off, I got thrown out the Maritime Museum for doing it. And I said, well, why have you got a Maritime Museum and you've got nothing about slavery? There would be no Maritime history if it wasn't for slavery. They built a little slavery museum Which there. they downgraded. Yeah, they downgraded. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, yeah, yeah. Africa OEA, yeah. biggest African music festival in the country. I don't know how people that started that. The Lado School of Africa, the only African drum and dance group, the only cultural organisation that's taught Ghanaian culture. Um, I was one of the people who started that. And that's why they despise me. You know, the anti, the anti hating black, the, the proper slave owners, they've got that mentality. You know, I own you, nigga. That's the mentality. Capital culture. Capital culture. That, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So I think, I mean, we can go on talking for hours, but I think we should have a lunch break now. Um, no, we're not trying to shut you down. No, I know, I know. Um, it's just, it's five past two. Oh, sorry, I was just going to grab the news. And, um, <laughs> um, what do you think? Should we try and have